Terrific. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, this uh, conference here. Um, while I get the opportunity, this really represents the work of a lot of uh, people at North Shore. I have a lot of great team members, so I'm very excited to share our initial uh, experiences. Um, as I was mentioning during the lunch ses session, I think with the implementation of this, we're definitely charting a, a, a new direction, but that path is still a dirt road and we have yet to pave it. So we've learned a lot, but uh, consider this version uh, 0.9, not even version 0.1.0 of where we need to be and where we want to go. So just some quick uh, disclosures here. Uh, just for those of you who may not be familiar with North Shore University Health System, um, we are uh, a medium to large size health care system on the north side of Chicago. We are patient catchment areas from uh, downtown Ch Chicago up to basically the Wisconsin um, border. Um, we have a relatively large center for medical genetics with three uh, MDs and five genetic counselors um, on staff currently. But like most institutions, um, you know, we were asked, you know, the fundamental question, well, how do we really start to scale services over a relatively broad geographic area, recognizing even with a, a large, uh, by many standards, genetics uh, division, how do we really capture uh, the patients that we need to be seeing, or at least identifying patients who may benefit from uh, um, genetic uh, risk assessment and testing potentially. Uh, we also are faced with a lot of um, similar re uh, realities that our like, local patient population is demanding these services. We're in a competitive area. Our footprint is also uh, one where they demand um, the, the latest innovation and application to their care as well. Um, we did have our Center for Medical Genetics, which um, for those in the crowd may not realize, uh, we were actually started initially by Henry Lynch of Lynch Syndrome um, in 1997. So we do have some historical roots in trying to uh, uh, bring genetics and genetic applications to our clinical care. But like many centers, uh, you know, we're limited in capacity with how many patients we can actually see. And really, uh, this served our clinic as a foundation. Well, how do we integrate and expand into other specialty clinics and overcome the same obstacles in a more systematic way that's preventing us from identifying patients who may benefit from clinical genetic services? And really, our vision has been now with the Center for Personalized Medicine, how do we really bring genomics to the front lines of care? You know, we used our special clinics as a launch pad for this for a system-wide initiative, and really um, was the foundation for the creation of our Center for Personalized Medicine to help us with developing the workflows and the educational aspects, both on provider and patient facing that are critical to have success in this arena. So we're not immune to the challenges many of us face. There are a lot of time constraints. Um, we have to educate not only our physicians, but our um, patients and all their healthcare providers from the administrative staff who helps check in the patient to our nurses, to um, the clinicians and patients themselves. Challenging battles with appointment links in terms of how do you deploy uh, sort of a risk assessment tool. Uh, there's many competing initiatives and guidelines that uh, our primary care force have to manage for uh, um, that are important for patient care. And still, there's a lot of realities versus myths that are out there regarding cost of testing, insurance reimbursement, um, awareness of GINA and other protections, and where those limitations are in terms of uh, the regulations. And sort of the elephant in the room is how are we really going to integrate this into an electronic medical record? One of my goals is help create more seamless workflows. Uh, we're on an EPIC-based system and we have a long history of integration across our health system. So how do we start to leverage our EMR in a positive way with genetics, whereas before finding a genetic result um, could be very difficult in an electronic medical record? As I mentioned, um, well, there are relatively few of us who are fully dedicated to our Center for Personalized Medicine in terms of FTE support. The FTE's uh, um, involvement has to cross many different lines and divisions, and so breaking down the, the traditional uh, barriers of siloed approaches was key to uh, our launch and, and our broader mission within the Center for Personalized Medicine. So having representatives of all these key st stakeholders, and really how do we also facilitate the handoff from the research in a translational aspect to um, the clinical and bedside care. 
So this led to our genetic and wellness assessment um, tool. It was a pilot that began in 2017. And basically it's a, a checklist, a genomics guide checklist that's sent to all patients uh, before their annual history and physical care via North Shore Connect. So North Shore Connect is what we call e our Epic MyChart um, application. And basically it was approximately 30 questions with branching logic to help identify patients, which we know is a challenge in any health system, who may benefit from targeted testing, so NCC and guideline-based testing, et cetera, and have uh, either genetic testing uh, uh, presented as an option for uh, pr being proceeded with or referred to one of our personalized medicine clinics as well. The key to this is integrating with existing workflows. We couldn't take our, our primary care physician out of their normal channels of, of workflows. Work, workflows. Um, once you tell them to go outside of the EMR, your project is pretty, pretty much not gonna be a success. Um, it also started to provide us with a platform to address some of the educational initiatives, giving real-time information to the clinician of why this is important for the patient and what could come of it and what are the next steps of action as well. So it also was an opportunity of us to explore uh, that transition and that opportunity from reactive and proactive testing. So what do I mean by that? Well, the reactive manner is, you know, traditional questions of uh, NCSN guidelines, is there a history of breast cancer, a personal history of breast cancer, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, and probing at some of the cardiomyopathy questions with sudden cardiac arrest or, or SIDS in the family, as well as a, or atopathy. These are things we know we should be asking about. There are guidelines for incorporating genetic testing, but we still have to do better as a health system of de identifying these patients. But then also moving to, well, an option for a proactive, because again, there's a growing segment of our population for sure, and we, start, we see this trend across um, the country of patients who want to know, is there something in our DNA or a change in our DNA that I should know about because I need to incorporate uh, uh, that into my screening and management? Um, our health, the Healthy Gene Panel is a prime example of this. And so this is actually, if a patient doesn't answer affirmatively to some of the more targeted questions, they're presented with an option to do a Healthy Gene Panel. And this is uh, Invitae's Healthy Gene Panel, um, looking at approximately 139 genes related to um, health risk, as well as pharmacogenomics taking that proactive approach of, well, I want to make sure I'm on the right medication. And while pharmacogenomics is not a crystal ball, it's not going to tell the precise dose and the exact drug someone should be on, it's another piece of information that can be layered upon uh, traditional clinical parameters. And one could argue that pharmacogenomics could also be a reactive. We know there's a diagnosis, for example, perhaps depression, that this information would be important as uh, getting in terms of the next step for the, our patient's care. So practically, what, what, what does this look like? Well, part of the experience is it needs to look like it's part of the patient experience as well, um, just like any other appointment process as well. So this is an example of what a patient would see um, through our North Shore Connect. Again, this is uh, uh, what we call our Epic My Chart. And basically, uh, about five to seven days before uh, patients encounter, they get a message. There's some things you need to do in, ter in terms of your upcoming appointment. So for example, uh, reviewing insurance information, et cetera, the usual logistic things that we need to take care of, but then you have a health assessment tool that's here. The reason why it's called a health assessment tool is it's not just genomics initiative, but we also have other things, for example, um, uh, the depression screen tool that we're required to deploy, um, the Wooly depression score, uh, as part of this uh, initial questionnaire. So uh, this is the web view. So your physician um, has asked you to complete this questionnaire and it asks for the knowledge, would you like to do it? This is an optional, patients aren't required to do it, but provides a way for our patients who are engaged um, uh, to get this information, to have an opportunity uh, to um, have this examined. It needs to be compatible on a mobile phone or mobile devices. Many of our patients, particularly the millennials, all they want to do is interact with their mobile phone, and we recognize this. This is actually me filling it out um, before my uh, annual history and physical exam. Uh, what's, what's been important is we've also tried to integrate with information that's already in Epic. So for example, when I did this and I completed it, here it says what some of the initial questions are. Do you have, or is there someone in your family has had cancer? Um, someone had heart disease? 
it's pre-populated with yes because it's pulling with inf pulling from information that's already in the EMR. Because one thing as a geneticist that um, bothers me is when I go for my update, my annual history and physical exam, every year I get the same blank family history uh, questionnaire. And it's a little embarrassing as a geneticist. I have to think, boy, how did I answer it last year? Because if I get this wrong, <laughs> this is going to be really embarrassing in front of my colleagues. So we're working on the bi-directional aspect of it, and that's a, a longer term aspect. But again, this is part of the dirt path we're building, and we need to pave that road as well. So part of this is, well, how do we get this information in the workflow of our clinicians? So again, this is during normal workflow for physician, um, triage, triaging based on the patient's answers and questions, and recommends it depending on what the logic dictated a best practice alert. So this is one where we've gone through a variety of iterations as we've uh, tried to uh, you know, engage our primary care physicians. Well, what is it what you want out of a BPA? And so in the blue, for those who can't read from the back, back, this is what was answered affirmatively. So we know what the reason is. So that offers an opportunity for the clinician to clarify, is this really what was part of the medical history that was important? A little bit about, well, why is this important? Some basic information. So in this case, you're talking about the chance of finding a BRCA mutation, someone who may have had Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Then putting in information about, well, what are the guidelines say in terms of well, what would I do with this information? And then sort of what would be the next steps? And so part of this is providing a clear path. Well, what do I do with this information so the clinician can know and understand why this is important and sort of what's next and talk to their patient about this. So uh, continuing on this, um, there are always uh, there are a variety of options that can occur depending on what the condition is, but there's always an option to refer to one of our personalized medicine clinics. We're not trying to turn everybody into geneticists or uh, genomics experts, but trying to provide an outlet uh, for those uh, uh, clinicians who uh, want to be proactive in this manner. So part of it, too, is if there is a targeted indication, there is a, a smart set that's built for a genetic test order that uh, a clinician can uh, can utilize if they're comfortable with talking about the issues around genetic testing, and that's an ongoing educational effort. But for a lot of our OBGYN colleagues, so this pilot or this uh, program is for all our primary care, which we consider internal medicine, family medicine, as well as OBGYN, uh, certain clinicians are very comfortable with this conversation in certain domains. So with that, um, we've had some, some initial great success. So again, this, although the pilot started um, in spring of 2017, we weren't really live at all our sites until about end of October, November of last year. So we have had about um, 90,000 encounters um, that were eligible for this, uh, this uh, questionnaire to be triggered. We have about a 75%, 77% com um, completion rate. Um, and then we have about 51% of patients um, um, who there was a best practice alert fired. We're still working on scrubbing the data to make sure it's accurate of well, what are these alerts, but it looks like maybe about a third could be related to um, uh, more of the proactive elements, so the healthy gene panel versus um, the uh, pharma genomics testing. So certainly encouraging because patients are, um, you know, are adapting and, and, and or excuse me, adopting this and want it as part of their care. So as far as, you know, where do we need to go in an improvement, we have to get under the hood of the data. And so we've created this personalized medicine dashboard that really helps us drill down on the processes. And this is certainly uh, why the morning session with implement implementation science really caught my eyes, because um, this is what we're trying to do, use this data and figure out well, what are the choke points. We know there are some. How do we deploy in a systematic way to overcome some of the hurdles? So to give you examples, what we're tracking, we can look at everything from the patient demographics, who's really uptaking us, drill down to what alerts are being fired, where are missed opportunities, meaning where a BPA fired but wasn't uh, perhaps acted on, um, what's happening to the referrals being generated, are they uh, matriculating to the clinics, why or why not, which labs are being um, ordered and whether they've been, um, what part of the process they are. I think something that's also key too is we're looking at, well, what's the downstream effect of this um, from a downstream revenue aspect? Because there's been a considerable investment, um, as has been discussed, it's not just the cost of the testing, but cost of a lot of the other uh, um, 
architecture around it. So what is the downstream revenue associated with this effort to justify and to make sure that we're not shifting the paradigm in, in, uh, in the wrong direction in terms of, our, uh, of cost and care. We can drill down to patient specific or uh, practice details at um, sites. We know there's implementation challenges at different sites depending on the, the patient population, but also the physician population. And so we can drill down at the physician level as well to start to really understand, well, where, where do we need to provide more support or education as a personalized medicine program? So we believe at North Shore that there's a benefit um, to both patients and North Shore. It's a start to a scalable approach. Well, how do we start to achieve system-wide uh, integration? Um, we are identifying patients who are at risk and who are unaware of possible carrier status. We've already had several BRCA positive individuals who've already un un underwent preventive mastectomy as a result of this program. We had an adopted patient who did not know their biological family history who was identified with a PMS2 mutation and has already seen um, our, our, uh, colon, um, our, our GI experts as well to put in appropriate screening as well as our guy non, uh, um, uh, specialists as well. So we're already seeing these anecdotal, but what we want to do is try to bring this into a more complete picture uh, for, the, for the genomic community. And we're seeing integration of our proactive screening. Um, there are definitely some early adopters, some power navigators that are interested in information, and we see this uh, continuing to grow, and we're get, gaining valuable experience in this effort as well. We believe it's a differentiator for primary care. We did some um, marketing, or our marketing team did some marketing analysis, and about a third of patients had a significant um, improvement and impression of the care delivered by the primary care physician, as well as North Shore when they were engaged in this process. Um, I'm not a marketing expert, but I hear it's rare to get a single factor that really shifts, um, you know, uh, a primary care uh, allegiance in such a way, and so that's part of the reason why. Uh, we uh, launched a campaign highlighting primary care in this aspect. Our primary care physicians, um, you know, it's an exciting opportunity for them as well because uh, not too many marketing campaigns or uh, initiatives really highlight primary care as much as, as some of the specialists. There are significant challenges and opportunities that we still have to tackle. Education, education, education. Um, did I list education? Uh, it's something that uh, you know we are continue to work on. I myself have been going out. I'm on my second round of going to every primary care site, um, um, which is about 30 sites, talking to them, what's working, what's not working. We've done more traditional method, me methods with grand rounds, et cetera, and webinars. Um, but I think, you know, we continue to need to ask, well, what, how can we do this better? Um, improve patient and clinical team follow through. We know there's a drop off at each step. So we know we can do this, but how can we do it better now is kind of the key question we're looking at. Well, how do we systematically do it? Where's the best opportunity? Um, and really, we think this is, um, you know, how do we start to integrate this into some of our affiliate physician practices as well? Um, to help, um, you know, the whole community, um, which is really, you know, important in, in our footprint as, and important stakeholders in our community, and create that infrastructure that is necessary for this data sharing across uh, different places that a patient might have um, touch points for their care. So goals, you know, we're looking to uh, employ some of the implementation research approaches to really assess um, these viewpoints uh, from key stakeholders. Um, again, continuing to support our primary care sites as we uh, continue to educate them on the goals and the mission and uh, improve our pull through statistics as well and ultimately improve patient care. So with that, um, I appreciate the opportunity to share our early experience with this program. Okay, a uh, quick, quick clarifying question. Could I just ask on the, the PCP sites that you're working with, mm -hmm. did you choose them in some way or are you doing everybody or? We, we chose them because they're North Shore primary care sites. So it's all our primary care sites. So we had three initial ones as a pilot, but that was about a month. And then we started to basically roll out one to two sites every week where I or one of my colleagues was on, on site with the, when they quote went live. And so we did about two to three practices over the summer going into, we finally ended up at October and November where every medical group primary care site is, is live. 
And so by primary care, primary care again, I mean um, uh, family practice, internal medicine, and OBGYN. Okay. Use your mic. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I just a question with the 36% of respondents who you identified needing follow-up. That mm. seems high. Mm. What, what was driving that? We, we had a similar experience, by the way, yeah. on the Florida campus. It was, it was also high when we used a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's part of what we're trying to figure out, what's driving that response. So it could be a number of reasons. Um, it could be some of the elective things. It could be, was there confusion about the questionnaire? And we're taking steps to further validate the questionnaire as, as well. Um, the short answer is, uh, we're, we're look, that's part of our year two goal is to see what's truly driving it. We know some early things, like we had some melanoma questions that, you know, this is where we had to pivot. They were not getting the sensitivity and specificity we wanted, and so we had to suppress those. So um, is, it's a complicated question, but we're trying to look at what are the key drivers, and I don't have that yet, but that's part of what we're building right now with our dashboards. Peter, thank you. Um, I think we'll move on to um, Misa Bastarash from Vanderbilt, um, looking at phenotypic mining in the electronic health records. 